Hello, everyone. I was thinking that I'm the last speaker. Just to give you the information, I'm not the last speaker. There's one more talk. Um, what I've been seeing in the last two or three days is, and I also think about you, that you've absorbed so much, so much of inspiring talks, and so much of new information, especially for the students who are, who are here. And what I'm going to talk about today is what can we do about this theme, the beyond design, and how can we prepare ourselves to become beyond designers? And I will, through my presentation, aim to leave some questions for you. The question will be very open-ended with the idea that you will actually figure out what you want to do next. So if you are ready for this, let's talk about talking about by starting with who, who are the beyond designers. We are at a stage right now where there are so many evolutions happening. There's a technological evolution. The user is becoming so much smarter. Everything is available. The designer can do things, but there is so much of competition. So you all are like figuring out, what should I do next? How can I be different? So to, to think about that, we are really trying to understand what are our changing roles. Are we doing the same, same every day, or is it going to be something different? How do we become exclusive? How do we work towards making a difference in this world of design? So what we are trying to create is, as I said, uh, to understand the profile of a future designer, we need to think about design, first of all. What is design? And design, all of you have a rough idea. You may have. But the, defi the definition of design is constantly changing. And certain things are remaining very similar, common. But a lot of new things are coming. So I want to actually start with showing you an interview of Charles Eames back in 1972, where he's being asked, what is design? And you need to think about, is this still relevant? Is this definition? So What is your definition of design, Monsieur Eames? One could describe design as a plan for arranging elements to accomplish a particular purpose. Is design an expression of art? I would rather say it's an expression of purpose. It may, if it is good enough, later be judged as art. Is design a craft for industrial purposes? No, but design may be a solution to some industrial problems. What are the boundaries of design? What are the boundaries of problems? So what are the boundaries of problems? And that's a very interesting question. What are the problems? And how do you look at problems? Majority of designers are thinking about finding solutions of problems. But I think it's very important for all of us to first know how to find the problems. And what are the relevant problems for us? So we need to go beyond this design, and we need to identify where are these problems hidden in, in several layers of opportunities we have in front of us. So I would like to start with a little bit of waking you up on this. I'm not going to ask you to get up, but I'm going to ask you to just raise your hands. We would try to make some uh, simple um, 
preferences of how do you fit yourself in everyday work. So I know a lot of you call yourself sketch artists. You think you are really good in sketching. So how many of you in this room feel very confident about it that you are sketch artists? You are very good in sketching. Raise your hands. I hope everyone can raise the hand for this. So this is one thing you would need as a core skill. You need to be a good sketch artist. The next one is, many of you are influenced by visual and sculptural qualities of design. It could be sculpture, it could be in design, in form. And maybe there are some of you who think like that. But there are others who are like, always sitting in the computer and making beautiful surfaces. And they think that this is, this is the end of life for me, like I'm going to be a car designer. Even if I design a washing machine, it should look like a car. If I, even if I design any appliance, any watch, any, anything, it has got those uh, great influences of uh, styling. How many of you are actually hardware geeks in this? in this room. Are there people who feel that we can fix everything? Is there anyone who can fix? There is one, two, maybe some more. So there are also people who are really good at this skill, that they, they are always the makers. They, they, they can't sketch, but they can build. And from there, they get the inspiration of how can they, they go forward. There are some people, no matter what they do, they get influenced by graphics, the visuals. And how many of you do not know this picture, by the way? Is there anyone who has not seen this picture before? Yes? So because there were only two hands or three hands, I will say that this is MC Escher. I love this picture for several reasons. For me, this is, this is interaction design. It talks about so many things happening in the frame simultaneously, and you can make your preferences. You can talk to this picture endlessly. You can think about the day, you can think about the night, you can think about the land, you can think about the birds, you can think about the whites, you can think about the blacks, and, and so on. And there is so much of transformation happening. And this is what is there. It is, it's not about a graphic. It can be in any product. It can be in any installation around us that we, we actually want to create interest among users that they are forever looking at the product and discovering new things and new layers in design. There are some people who only give attention to details and they forget the rest of the form. For them, the, the logo on the car is more important. For them, the, the geometric arrangement is more important. Forget about the rest of the whole form, but they want to look at only specifics. As we move forward, there are people who are constantly looking at creating new experiences. How many of you aim to do this in your, in your lives, that you just want to play with new experiences? At least five. I hope this becomes 50. But this is where the opportunity is, that the, what can we do by using the temporal qualities of design? And then this is like, I would say, the safety dance. The form follows function designers. You get a brief. you. You solve the problems, you work with the minimalism as a criteria, but this really is majority of the design which happens today. People want sensible solutions. So if you think you are one of these, then I think that's not enough to go beyond design. Is, this won't work. I think to understand this further, we need to, to look at some of the famous definitions of designs which have evolved over the years. So 
This has been my favorite definition for a long time about design, and it comes from ICSID, the International Council for Society of Industrial Design, where they talk about design being a creative activity whose aim is to establish the multifaceted qualities of objects, processes, desires, services, and, and also it's talking about designing being the central factor of innovative humanization, of technologies, of culture, of, of economic ex exchange. So what I want to ask you about you, if someone can guess here, how old is this definition? Maybe Ron would know. How old is this definition? So this definition is more than 25 years old. And this is still relevant. And that's the beauty of it, that you can actually think of all the discussions which were happening today, and we, we still feel that there are so many factors which were happening back then, when they created this definition, which are relevant today. But maybe we are not addressing all of these 20 years ago, we are, we are addressing these things only now. So what I've done is, from here you, you will realize that you can actually pull down these words and see that these words can actually become future scope of areas of design for you. You can work on objects or services, you can work on innovation, you can work on only cultural and economic exchange by being a service designer, you can work with other designers, collaborate with, with people to create multifaceted qualities. But then, as I was researching this, I figured out that there was the first definition of design on this website of ICSID. So this is the world body of industrial designers. And back in 1969, they said industrial design is a creative activity. Of course, they were calling it creative activity, uh, always. But they were focusing on the formal qualities of objects. So, so it kind of tells that back in 69, product, like the focus was very much object-based. But then they are also talking about the, the last line, which, which they talk about, that industrial design extends to embrace all the aspects of human environment, which means that back in 1969, we were talking about sustainability. We were talking about environment. But maybe 1% out of the whole design jobs we were doing. So what we gather from here is, if you, if you pull down the keywords from here, that design still offers creative activity it still offers industrial production. It still offers you to work on coherent unity. So you, you, you notice that this is still happening. This is still relevant, even though it is 50 years old. But you can still fit yourself and get a job in, in these areas. But then something interesting I, I observed, this is the last definition of design they've created where they call, again, design has become industrial design, and they call it, it being a strategic design problem-solving process which uh, drives innovation, and it builds business success. So what's happening is that suddenly the designer has come right in the middle. The designer has become a facilitator. The designer has become an enabler of business. The designer has become the hope for people to create better quality of life. And that we are able to do by questioning what is there and what is possible to create. So that's something where we are, and I think that's, that's the thing, that you, whenever you look at products, whenever you look at interfaces, whether you look at textiles, you should try to see What's possible? What can be done differently? And if you can't do it yourself, call others. So this is the age where 
Just calling yourself an industrial designer and making only those things is not enough. You can benefit so much. You can, you can bring in, like we saw in the previous uh, presentation of the, of the car design, you can bring in so much of value of textile. You can, you can bring in so much of value of materiality. You can, you can just work in color and light. So this is where we are, but the last sentence of this definition is also an important one, that we are actually looking at the future by reframing problems and opportunities. But what is important to remember is what is present and what's possible to change. And how can you resolve and reframe these, these problems? So what I did here is that I actually took the years and I took the keywords, and it is for you to, to look over here that how there are similarities and how there are differences, and how probably the designers who are 50 years older than us, what they are capable of doing, and if you are looking at 2015 onwards or, or today, what are we able to do differently? So this also gives me jitters to people like me. I think I'm from the middle uh, section, that maybe I need to prepare myself with more skills. I need to understand more softwares. I need to probably be aware of more activities happening around so that I can become the, the transdisciplinary designer who can improve the quality of life. So what happened during this time was, if you look at the focus, so back in 1969 or 70s, the design activity was very object-oriented. But over the turn of the millennium, it became very user-centric. And where are we today? We are defining new values. We are enriching this design values. What can we do new? We have so many things. And that's what you see in the iPhones and and cars and everything, everything is available. Well, you, you try to see what's different in this car model compared to the other, what's different in this mobile phone compared to the other, and so on. You are, you're always looking at what exclusive different feature this product offers to you. So again, I club them together, and this creates new profile for you guys. So you can, it's up to you whether you want to take pictures or you just think about it, where do you fit yourself? What kind of designer are you? Are you the experienced designer? Are you the production and object process-oriented designer? Are you the innovator? Or are you a service designer? So all these profiles, they come up here. But I still feel this is not enough. We need to do something new. So those of you who have been design students 50 years ago, those of you who are design students today, I feel it's very important to understand where do we learn new skills and how those environments affect us. So I have actually been traveling and seeing different schools and I see what people do in these schools. And what are these nostalgic things which you remember. Of course, you, you would remember what you studied in the studios, but I think these, these things are much more important. How you come together, what you do, what, how you break for your lunch time, what are the memories. I think these are super important. You know there are, there are studios, there are facilities in your workshops, but most of you remember the nostalgia, the light, how the, the sun sets in this workshop area in, in Ankara, or, or how you remember when you're going home after finishing your studio time, that this is how the parking lot look, look, looks like. Remember, these things are working in a very subconscious manner on you. 
they have a big influence on you. So we feel that our role as educators is definitely to provide you these kind of conditions that you can, you can find your own inspiration corners. You can find your own motivation to be there instead of sitting in dark rooms and, and those kind of studios. So these were all my uh, travels from uh, the, the previous uh, trip to, uh, uh, to Turkey. And then actually I, I got reminded of uh, this definition from Ken Robinson, who said that learning environments can really take us beyond. He says, we don't have to design educational institutes or schools we have to actually create and provide conditions under which the learners can flourish. So that's why I say it's important to, to love your school. It's, or it's also important to love your design office. And it does happen to many of us that we, we go to our office every day, but we find that space so boring, so demotivating, that we just run to a cafe to make our sketches. Happens, this is very, very much like a common thing, you need a break, you, you need to go somewhere else. So this is what happened to me. So this is the school where I studied in India at NID. And what I remember about this building is that I got so much framed in the frames. I saw so many grids and rectangles. Wherever I would go, I, I started looking at precision and that helped me to understand how I'm working with my model makers, how I'm working in the industry. Because of these buildings, I realized that I'm never making mistakes. For me, a right angle is a right angle. Wherever I am, I can, I can identify it. And that's me over there back in 98. But what, I, what we are doing actually is that we all are standing there looking at a peacock in the garden. So, when I think of my school, apart from thinking about the studios, I actually think about the peacocks. So another aspect of thinking about the products is, I'm, I'm writing products because by default I'm an industrial designer, that products also create some kind of a response and action. When you look at a product, you nearly fall in love with it because you start interacting with it, be it a phone, be it a, be it a shoe, or be it a sofa, whatever, and you kind of start talking to it. The, the product starts telling their own stories and you start making your connections. But what are these connections is also quite interesting, that any object or any entity you see, it has probably these three areas in which you, you start liking the, the, the objects. You either create a very emotional connection with these objects, that you, you actually like the silhouettes, you like the way, maybe it's just a brand you like, or you just like the physical arrangement of these products, or sometimes you, you just like the details. So that's the elemental connection. And I won't say that you only like one thing in a product. It's usually a combination of these, these three factors. So it's also important to find your inspirations. This is my inspiration. When I was a student and even now, I love this Brancusi sculpture. And whenever I look at it, I, I just feel that I wish I could design something like that. I love these silhouettes. I like these Eames furniture. I like the precision and the, the quality of Bang & Olufsen products. And uh, one of them is, I, I own one of the products simply because I was so much in, in love with this product that I waited for 20 years till I could afford this old used uh, stereo, but I still bought it just because I like the physical connection of this. But then, like most of you, I also have an elemental connection with the products where I waited and waited to buy this phone in black because that's how Apple advertised it, that this is that gaga black and this is how it has been produced. And 
I could have bought the iPhone 7, but I waited to buy the 7 Plus. But by the time I bought it, they came out with another one. And that also happens. What do you do? That you fall in love with one element, and suddenly it's replaced by something else. And that's what Apple is doing. They are, they are really playing with your, with your emotions there. And you don't mind, you, you, you buy the next one. And by the time you get used to that one, they come out with the third one. So I don't know what will happen next. But your elemental connection keeps on increasing with products after products. So this is another connection, uh, an emotional connection I have with these products. They are work of my students. The left one is from India, and the right one is from Sweden. But it's about these superfluous surfaces. But the interesting thing was that they are designed in a gap of about 10 years. They had the same inspiration, the Arne Jacobson chair. And uh, it's like how people are making associations, what are they remembering, so it's also important from that point of view. So it gives me the same kind of a feeling of Brancusi's heads, that how they are different, they, are, they have a different theme. It's the same over here. And when I look at these two products, that they, they kind of remind me of the same kind of design treatments. So it's also important when you're going beyond design, to actually to rethink your working styles. So this is what I do on an everyday basis. I'm, I'm in the studios working with the students, working on making models and doing very hands-on activities. And this is routine for me uh, to do this uh, work. But I think if I have to go beyond and if I have to catch up with you guys, I also need to learn these. So, so that's a preparation that I'm ready for changes and challenges. And because I feel that products are no longer about appearances. Products are actually about their experiences. So then I was trying to rediscover myself in education. And I, I thought that, OK, instead of looking at just physical aspects, let's play with sound. What does the, the effect of sound do to any physicality of a product? And then this was a turning point that we could actually play with light, sound, form, all together. And, and we, we, we did these workshops on medium and form. And we went further that what if it's not only about imagining a transportation sculpture, what if you embed lights in it that you can actually look at different qualities of uh, a vehicle. So this is actually, um, again, about a 10 years old project. But what we were trying to do over here was we were trying to create um, different associations of how future vehicles could look like. So it's also important to, to think about what do we expect from you? And what we expect from you as educators, if, you're, if we are making you ready for the, for the future, is we feel that all of you should have some, you should be looking for new opportunities, you should be looking for new experiences, and you should be able to envision future scenarios. But you should also be able to draw well. You should also be able to communicate well, and you should also be able to be familiar with different materials. So when you, when you put all these things together, you find, again, new roles for yourself working in the industry. You can work as creative strategists by, by just working in foresighting and strategy. You can work like sketch artists and visualizers if you're really good in your communication skills. You can work as color and material experts. You can work as prototype designers by, if you're just hardware geeks. But the last one is equally important. We need a lot of product managers today. People who can lead a whole project, people who can manage it. So we, this is actually the full design process. Some of you agree with me that this is what is happening. This is what we are doing, actually. That's why I feel 
this is also gone. We need to think beyond it. So I feel this is what it is, that no, normally a creative process is about how you evolve ideas, how you go further, how do you refine them. But it's very important how you look at the next levels. This is beyond. So I will say beyond layer one, that you actually further, this I should have written beyond creative process, that you should look at how can you enhance and enrich or enable your solutions so that they can do something more. Normal is boring. So we saw that there are so many people won awards over here, but the criteria of them winning the awards was they were better than this one. Everyone was doing this initially. Every entry must have had this, but they were, you could see that some ideas were better than the others and they became award winners. But this is still not enough. You need to actually think about how you make your products exclusive. How can you work with empathy? How can you create newer and fresher experiences? So I work in Lund University School of Design and we try to work with different themes like and we call design is cooperation because we work very closely with IKEA, trying to understand what is, what is the kitchen of the future, what is the, how will people eat in their kitchens. We have a cooperation with NASA where we send students to Houston to actually study what are the opportunities we can study of people going up in the space and what if we bring them back into the real world and what could we do with them. So, because we consider that we are really preparing the astronauts to live in a very different condition, we are talking about future that's about to happen. So we do this every year, and we, we try to understand how do you grow plants. If, if you can grow plants in, I wouldn't say zero gravity, but anti-gravity or in enclosed spaces, so how do you actually look at those experiences and try something inside your homes? How can you grow plants in refrigerators? How can you... So this particular project is about... This guy was thinking, how are astronauts taking shower in the space shuttle, if they are? So this is actually a, a rip-off of a project where he, the student is trying to, to use the same technology, and I will show you the video of what, what he learns from the space shuttle technology. This is another project many of you would have seen uh, about innovation that how a person is able to go beyond the concept of helmet and turns that into an airbag. And this was very recent. One of the bachelor students, he said, I'm, I want to do a packaging concept, but I don't want to do it in plastics. So you want to replace something. So, and then there's another student, of course, this is from my, my previous work in Umeo, and he is actually working with empathy and play. He is actually working with, um, with a very big social problem in Colombia and other places where a lot of people, you know, lose their arms or their limbs. And he has actually combined a, a beautiful project of Lego and he's enabled a new dimension for this kid to actually be able to play with the arm which the kid has actually given up. So, in the end, I feel these are the four areas which are important from, from the point of view of what we are offering to our students, that we are looking at how are these new beyond design qualities defined. We are thinking about beyond safety, beyond consumption, beyond materiality, and beyond empathy. So, in the end... Colombian designer Carlos Arturo Torres wanted child amputees to forget about the social and psychological challenges sometimes associated with missing limbs and instead get kids to have fun with their prosthetics. The Lego compatible arm called the IKO Creative Prosthetic System and designed with Lego Future Lab snapped up the prize for open student design at the Core 77 Design Awards. You're seeing a fully functioning prototype and clearly this kid was feeling creative. He made himself a construction backhoe, a claw, he even attached 
crashed a spaceship with a laser pointer on it. He let his imagination run wild, and that's the point. It has a detachable robotic hand, a charging port, processor unit, and sensors to track movement. So it moves when your hand moves. The designer says he's in the process of developing a commercial product and says we should be able to get our hands on it in late 2016 or mid-2017. Building with Legos will never be more fun and functional. So look at the happiness on that child's face that he could also play. And uh, this is actually a, a degree project, a final year project from the student. And now he, he's developing it. And this is the other one. So the inspiration of this project was not a big boxy helmet, but you know, one fine day, these two girls, uh, the girl students, they, they just kept a plastic bag on their neck, and they just inflated it. So it all started there, that they did not stop there. They said, now we will go to the physics department, and we'll try to figure out how does an airbag work? And that's how they could go beyond, and they became rich. They turned Hobding into a, their company. And this the is average the, Western European uses up to 200 one. liters of fresh water every day. Clean tap water is something we take for granted. How are we going to use our vital resources in the future? Water is one of our most important ones, so we have to focus on it. Industrial designer Meerdad Majubi came to that conclusion as a student while researching water supply for space travel. His work brought him to one of the biggest wasters of water in the world. The shower. A conventional shower uses up more than 100 liters of water in just 10 minutes, and five kilowatt hours of energy are needed to heat up the water, which soon goes down the drain. Majubi invented a shower that requires fewer than five liters of water and less than one kilowatt hour of energy, no matter how much time one spends in the shower. How does it work? The shower recycles the water within a closed loop system. Microfilters remove the dirt. Ultraviolet light kills bacteria. And a heater prevents the water from cooling, keeping it at a steady temperature. It's currently the most efficient system for saving water and energy in the world. What comes out of the shower head? Water that's even purer than from your tap. Meerdad Majubi has invented the shower of the future. So, a very simple project. It's not it is about the rocket science, but this wasn't really rocket science. He just write the, he asked the right questions. He says, how are they having shower up in the space? He found a technology. The technology was obsolete. 
So he said, can I actually get hold of this technology and can I get hold of the engineers when, when they, he was there in Houston? And he continued to work, continued, and then one fine day, a Danish venture capitalist came to him and now he's set up a, a million euro company. He's doing pretty well. And the next entrepreneur is just getting ready because he wanted to go beyond plastics. He just wanted to challenge the thinking. Pontus Turkvist says his plastic bags are good enough to eat. He's made them out of potato starch and says they could help solve the growing problem of single-use plastic. It started out as a mistake, actually. Um, first, I wanted the building stone, the material, to be seaweed. So I went up to my hometown, collected some seaweed, and uh, dried it. And uh, I tried to find a binder for it. Uh, and one of these binders was uh, potato starch and water. But uh, I spilled some of this fluid. And uh, later on, I saw that it had uh, dried to a plastic-like film. And I found it very interesting. Farms discard up to 20% of their potatoes for being ugly, and they get turned into starch. Turnquist added glycerol to the mix to give it flexibility. Plastic bags take hundreds of years to decompose. His bags break down in soil in two months. He's also made throwaway cutlery with a range of knives, forks, spoons and cups. So as you can see, it's pretty durable. It works. Now I'm going to see if the fork works as well. It did. Turnquist purposely made his cutlery functional looking, but says it would be easy to make them look more professional. He's received much commercial interest as the fast food industry grapples with a European ban on single-use plastics. Last month, he won a prestigious James Dyson Award for innovation, chosen in part for his product range's eco-credentials. So, all these four examples were asking those simple questions. How can I not use plastic? How can I save water? How can I go beyond the helmet? And how can I actually do something with the prosthetic arm and playability? So these are all the beginning of these questions, I'm sure you will have several questions. And what was important about all these four projects was these guys were really passionate about what they were doing. They didn't give up. Many times, your beautiful ideas, they just stay in your sketchbooks. So my earnest request to you would be just follow your inspirations, follow your dreams, and keep, keep going for it. So this is in a nutshell, the kind of opportunities which would evolve, which have already evolved in the world, and they, they can give you enormous possibilities of working further. And I leave you guys with these questions. What is it that you can do beyond? How can you also win a James Dyson Award? How can you also create a million dollar company? So I wish you all the best for that. So, you have to think, is this enough or you need to do something different from them? So that's the question I leave. Let's go beyond. Thank you very much.